Well, good afternoon and welcome to the New York Foreign Press Center. This briefing today is on U.S. priorities for UNGA 2023 and foreign policy news of the day. As a reminder, today's briefing is on the record and we will post a transcript of the briefing at fpc.state.gov later today. Our distinguished briefer today is John Kirby, NSC Coordinator for Strategic Communications. He will start with some opening remarks and then take your questions. And when he calls on you, please make sure you state your name and your media outlet. And with that, it's a pleasure as always to turn the floor over to John. Thank you. Hey everybody. Uh, thanks very much for allowing me to spend some time with you today, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, as you all know, don't, certainly don't need me to remind you that world leaders are coming together here in New York for the 78th session of the UN General Assembly. President Biden here is, is here in town, be visiting through Wednesday, uh, and he's very much eager to use this trip to advance U.S. interests and our values on a range of issues from mobilizing financial resources for the global south for development and infrastructure to galvanizing cooperation to tackle the climate crisis to strengthening global support for ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity as it continues to defend itself against russia's war of aggression tomorrow president biden will deliver his annual address to the general assembly and in that speech i think you can expect that he will lay out for the world the steps that he and this administration have taken to advance a vision of American leadership that is built on the promise and the premise of working with others to solve the world's most pressing problems. As you may have heard the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, say uh, last week, we have put a lot of points on the board, to quote Jake, and the President will talk about how those steps that he's taken uh, has helped contribute to a larger foreign policy vision. In addition to speaking before the General Assembly, the President will also have a chance to meet with UN Sec Secretary General, Mr. Uh, Mr. Guterres, and they will discuss pressing global issues, including mobilizing additional resources for sustainable development, combating climate change, and upholding the UN's foundational principles. The President will also have a chance to meet with the presidents of five Central Asian nations, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. This will be the first ever C5 plus one presidential summit. This inaugural summit will allow for the leaders to discuss a range of issues from regional security to trade and connectivity to climate change, of course, and to ongoing reforms to improve governance and the rule of law. The president will also host the traditional reception, of course, with world leaders, where he'll have the chance to engage with dozens of heads of state and government from around the world. Then on Wednesday, the President will have the opportunity to hold a bilateral meeting with President Lula of Brazil, as well as to join him in an event with labor leaders from Brazil and from the United States to highlight the central and critical role that workers play in building a sustainable, democratic, equitable, and peaceful world. Also on Wednesday, President Biden will sit down with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel to discuss a range of bilateral and regional issues focused on our shared democratic values, the same democratic values that we share between the United States and with Israel, and a vision for a more stable and prosperous, and quite frankly, an integrated Middle East, as well as to compare notes on how we are effectively countering and deterring Iran. We will have more information, of course, to follow on the President's engagement on Wednesday, but just allow me to finish with this. The President is heading here uh, into the UN General Assembly uh, uh, with the United States in a, from a, in a position of strength uh, and confidence, with strong allies, new partners, a vision for institutional reform at the UN and at the World Bank and elsewhere, with initiatives to deliver on infrastructure, on health, on climate, and other global public goods. We come here again with the wind at our back, but understanding that uh, the work of achieving the president's foreign policy vision is going to take a concerted effort, not just continued effort by the United States, but a continued effort collaboratively with our allies and our partners. And with that, we can take some questions. Yeah. Um, thank you. 
Thank you, John, for doing this Magda Sakowska Polsat News um, uh, Poland. Um, this year, um, such leaders as President uh, Xi, President Macron, Prime Minister Sunak will skip the uh, General Assembly. So the President Biden is the only leader among the leaders of the five permanent members of uh, Security Council. How will President Biden um, make use of this situation, that he's the only one? Uh, well, certainly we, we would not speak for other foreign leaders in their decision to attend or, or not to attend. Um, the president came here to work. And n that's not going to change his what he's trying to achieve, all the things I talked about in my opening statement, uh, the meetings he's going to have, the progress we're going to try to pursue wouldn't change re regardless of uh, what other members of the uh, uh, permanent members of the Security Council were here or not. Um, they get they get to decide, of course, what their uh, what their attendance looks like. But uh, the president's confident that again we're pursuing a concrete, um, uh, tangible set uh, of initiatives here, from climate change to global development to global health. Um, and again, that's not going to be dependent on any one leader being here or not. Yeah, right there in a black jacket. Thank you so much. I appreciate the play. Good to see you again here in New York. Uh, from a strategic point of view, which countries in Asia are the United States strategic partners and what the United States foreign policy would look like in the near future towards this country, these, these countries in the region? Also, my second part of question is, what is the United States foreign policy towards Afghanistan as so many people, including the US lawmakers, say that the current situation in Afghanistan is the legacy of your administration, Biden administrations? Thank you. Uh, look, there's an awful lot there. I'll try to keep this crisp. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the president has prioritized the Indo-Pacific region since the very, very beginning of this administration. The first two leaders that he had to the White House were uh, the leaders of Japan and, and South Korea, and you just saw a trilateral summit at Camp David a few weeks ago where we really put to paper uh, an emphasis on increased trilateral cooperation between uh, our three countries. That's point number one. Point number two, I think a lot of people forget that five of the seven treaty alliances that the United States has are in the Indo-Pacific region, five of seven. So we have significant uh, national security commitments, uh, not just to individual countries, but to a multilateral framework uh, of nations uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, number three, in addition to those five treaty alliances, uh, we are participating in encouraging and gendering and, um, and supporting uh, a range of other, as I said, multilateral arrangements like the Indo-Pacific Quad. Vice President Harris was uh, just recently uh, representing uh, the United States at the at the uh, U.S. ASEAN summit, um, and uh, through a series of other uh, more informal um, uh, venues, the United States continues to pursue um, and to strengthen the, the, our vast network of alliances and partnerships. No other nation in the world uh, enjoys the, the the kind of support we we have. Uh, in a multilateral way all around the world. No other nation enjoys our network of allies and partners. Um, and the president has really put a premium, and you're going to hear him talk about this tomorrow, really put a premium on revitalizing those alliances and partnerships, clearly in the Indo-Pacific, but also around the world. I mean, NATO is now bigger and much more relevant uh, than it was just a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, certainly Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine is... Uh, played a factor in that, but so too, uh, quite frankly, has President Biden's leadership on the world stage. Now, as for uh, Afghanistan, I, 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 I don't know if I'm going to answer this question the way you asked it or not, so if I don't, you tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, we have not recognized the Taliban. There are no plans to do that at this point. If they want to be seen as legitimate, then they need to legitimately meet the commitments they made to the international community about how they would govern, particularly when it comes to the treatment of women and girls. And they have not only not done that, they've gone the other way. So there's no plans right now to recognize uh, the, the Taliban. Um, and as for 
any threat of, of terrorism. I think you saw the intelligence community um, make a statement uh, uh, a week or so ago that certainly the al-Qaeda threat is vastly, vastly diminished and unlikely to return in Afghanistan. We're keeping an eye, of course, uh, on other terrorist networks that could use ungoverned spaces there and elsewhere. Um, and as the president has made clear and has and our military has proven, we have improved and have maintained a viable counter uh, over the horizon counterterrorism capability uh, to continue to look after, again, uh, our national security interests and those of our, our friends. Uh, let me move around. I promise I'll get to everybody. Yes, ma'am. Or I'll get to everybody I can in the 45 minutes I have. Uh, Corriere della Sera, um, uh, Viviana Mazza. Um, there is, uh, Zelensky is going to uh, talk here and is going to be at the center of the attention. And the global south, uh, countries of the global south are worried that their priorities are not going to be listened to. Um, what is President Biden going to do? What can he do? And is he aware of this need to uh, reassure these countries that the US is there and their priorities financially will be met? And second thing, Sullivan met with Wang Yi in Malta. Um, and Wang Yi went to, to see Lavrov and talked about strategic cooperation. Has anything changed after Sullivan met him um, in terms of Biden and Xi seeing each other, but in other terms as well? Thank you. On the second question, not that I'm aware of, no, we still don't have a scheduled meeting between President Biden and President Xi. As you've heard President Biden say many times, he looks forward to having another conversation, another uh, another meeting with President Xi, and that'll happen at the appropriate time and in the, uh, in the appropriate amount of space. We're just, we're just not there yet. What has happened in recent months and what we hope will continue, and Jake's trip to Malta is an example of this, um, is keeping the lines of communication open, um, getting them open again and keeping them open. So, so we've had Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Commerce, Special Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, um, sir, certainly Secretary Blinken, the Secretary of State, uh, uh, kind of kicked it off all with a trip to, to Beijing. Um, and those have been productive conversations on key issues, economically and diplomatically, that, that, that we're facing. Now, what, what hasn't happened is the military-to-military -military lines of communication are still not open, and uh, we still want to pursue an avenue to do that because that's where the tensions uh, in and around uh, the Western Pacific uh, are at risk of miscalculation. And miscalculation could lead to, um, to decisions that neither one of us want to see happen. Nobody's looking for conflict here, so we want to see those military-to-military -military lines opened up. Uh, but there's been a fair amount of dialogue and communication, and the president has really put a premium on that. He'd like to get back to a point uh, where we were in Bali at the uh, at the G20 last year, when the two of them had a chance to meet and talked about how to responsibly manage this relationship going forward. So again, uh, things are are moving in a better direction, uh, and the president's um, uh, convinced that it's that it's important that we continue to have. A sense of dialogue. So uh, now, as for Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Wang Yi's visit to, to Moscow, they, they can talk about that and what their you know what their uh, what their meeting agenda is going to be all about. Uh, but for us, it really is a, a a matter of keeping these lines these lines open. So uh, you know, good set of discussions there with uh, with uh, Jake and uh, and uh, Wang Yi. Um, your first question about. Uh, uh, President Zelensky, I'm sorry, and, the, and it was it was the global, global south. Priority. So uh, um, it's a great question, and I think you're certainly going to hear the president talk about the global south uh, in his remarks tomorrow, and talk about all that we've been doing in this administration to pay attention to uh, the global health the economic, um, the food insecurity concerns, um, and the investment needs, infrastructure investment needs of the global south. It was President Biden who spearheaded at last year's G7, uh, this idea of the, the program for global investment and in infrastructure, PGI, we shortened it to. Um, and that is up and running, and the United States continues to contribute to that, and so, and so have other nations. Um, we have, uh, at, this, at this last G20, we announced 
uh, a ship and rail corridor that will connect India uh, to Europe through the Middle East and, and, and Italy. Um, uh, so he's very much focused on meeting the needs and addressing the concerns of the global south. And it's been a priority of, uh, for him since, again, since day one. You will hear him talk about this uh, tomorrow. One of the other things that he spearheaded at this G20, uh, the most recent G20 here a couple of weeks ago, and I think you'll hear him talk about again tomorrow, is the need for reform of multilateral development banks to provide lower and middle income countries high quality and more transparent alternatives to seek financing and support for in infrastructure and investment, uh, economic investment across the board, but largely for infrastructure. So we want to make sure, and, and he has asked Congress for additional funding, uh, several billion dollars that we can provide to the World Bank uh, that will hopefully encourage other like contributions by other nations, which could lead to more than $20 billion worth of available financing from the World Bank for the Global South. So there's been an awful lot of focus by President Biden on the Global South. And again, I think um, I'm not getting too far ahead of my boss in telling you that he will fully be prepared to talk about that uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, I mean, Take a look at on Wednesday, you know, when he meets with President Lula, they're gonna they're and labor leaders to really talk about how we can improve workers' lives. Um, again, in places like the Global South, better compensation, better benefits, safer work environments and working conditions. Um, all those things are, I think, are a testament to how seriously the president takes that challenge. I'll say one more thing on the Global South and then I'll shut up. Um, a lot of the challenges that they're facing, not all, I'm not suggesting all, but a lot of them have been exacerbated, if, in, if not caused, by Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine. Now, the Russians would have you believe it's the West's fault, but that they're not at fault. They're never at fault, but they are. The food insecurity, the economic problems, um, uh, a lot of that has been caused, the inflation that many of these nations are facing. Um, a lot of that has been caused by Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine, and particularly when it comes to food insecurity. And now they've, of course, just recently decided not to extend the, the Black Sea Grain Initiative. So who's going who's gonna to pay the, the highest cost of that? As obviously, the Ukrainian people continue to pay the highest cost, but uh, it will also be borne by lower and middle income countries in the global south. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sorry. That that answered probably questions you didn't even ask me. Yeah, in the blue shirt there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. I have a short country-specific question. Robert Pardos from Slovenia Press. <laughs> no, you can be long as much as you want. Robert Pardos from the Slovenian Press Agency. Um, are you happy with uh, Slovenia's election to the Security Council? And do you have any issues, questions that you expect the closest uh, coordination cooperation with Slovenian Security Council in the next two years? Well, we certainly uh, applaud their ascendancy and uh, look forward to working with Slovenia um, uh, as they take the mantle. Um, Slovenia, as you know, is a, a NATO ally, uh, a trusted and valued NATO ally. Um, we have already been uh, working closely with uh, Slovenia with respect to the war in Ukraine and trying to do what we can to support uh, Ukraine. And um, I have no doubt that that level of cooperation and communication with Slovenia will continue certainly when it comes to um, uh, supporting President Zelensky and the Ukrainian armed forces as well as the Ukrainian people. But there'll be a spate of other issues. I have no doubt that we'll want to continue to work closely uh, with Slovenia from climate change to economic development and infrastructure improvement um, uh, in lower and middle income countries, global health, uh, cyber and artificial intelligence. There's a, a range of issues that uh, we look forward to working with. Uh, let me go back over here. Yes, in the back. Uh, yeah, second. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jiha Ham with Voice of America. Uh, the Russian foreign minister said uh, that they have not declared uh, uh, the sanctions on North Korea, uh, but the Security Council did that. That's what uh, Mr. Lavrov said. So we have heard many Last times. I checked the Rus Russians were permanent member of the Security Right, so that was, that, that right? that's my question. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, I'm not sure I'm buying that argument. Okay, so yeah, so my question was, you know, what would be your response? But you know, your, well, there you I guess go. there's my response, right? And also, the Russians um, presented Kim Jong Un with six drones. Um, 
and some UN sanctioned North Korean individuals traveled to Russia with Kim Jong Un, uh, meaning that they have violated multiple UN sanctions uh, with Russia and North Korea, both both countries. So, would there be any punitive measures, or do you have any plan to uh, or uh, to raise this issue during the president's visit? Well, I will uh, certainly continue. Well, let me let me back up. Um, we have been monitoring this uh, burgeoning relationship between North Korea uh, and Russia for, for quite some time. In fact, we made public some of our concerns about uh, what we saw was the potential for some sort of leader-level engagement. And we've also urged North Korea to meet its own commitments, public commitments, that it would not support Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine. Um, we saw the comments coming out of Kim Jong-un's meeting, comments coming from the Kremlin that there was no deal announced. We'll, we'll take that with a grain of salt and we'll watch. We'll continue to monitor it as we said we would. Um, any deal would be a violation of UNSC resolutions. Resolutions that, as I said earlier, the Russians signed up to. And we will certainly continue to talk with our partners here at the UN um, uh, about uh, how we might work together uh, to, uh, to hold uh, both sides accountable should they should they move in that direction uh, over here back there with glasses there red tie yeah Thank you. Uh, Paolo Mastrolilli with the Italian Daily La Repubblica. You said that the president will encourage a revision of the architecture of the Security Council. Uh, is he thinking of proposing new uh, permanent member with veto powers for the Global South? Uh, the president last year when he was here, and I think he'll make the same case this year, would like to see a more inclusive um, Security Council, both permanent and non-permanent. Um, I don't have anything to announce or speak to today in terms of how, how, uh, what the mechanics of that would look like. But in general, the president believes that uh, the Security Council should be more inclusive of more nations around the world. More voices should be heard, uh, including from the global south. Uh, let me go back over here in the back there, the blue. Yes, uh, Sarah Canals from uh, Cadena Ser, Spain. Um, just to follow up on China, I understand there's a meeting between uh, Secretary Blinken and Chinese mm -hmm. Vice President shortly here in New York. If you could provide any details on that, uh, was it already scheduled before yesterday's um, meeting in Malta? Just a little bit of, of background here. I'm afraid Thank I'm you. not going to be much help on that one. Um, I'd refer you to the State Department. I, I, I don't know when that I don't know when that visit was was scheduled, and I'm I have no doubt that uh, Secretary Blinken's team will provide a readout for you of what they discussed after it's over. I'm sorry, I can't be more help on that. Sure, go ahead. Um, wait, wait for the microphone. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, tell me who you are. Uh, Diana Casalam from Caracol Radio, uh, Colombia. So, President Petro, Colombian President, uh, said uh, recently yesterday that uh, members of the administration, the Biden administration, uh, requested Colombia to build up some sort of wall in between Colombia and Panama to reduce migration, illegal migration, up to the United States. Is that correct? And also, I just wanted to know if there's uh, any information about uh, how this could actually reduce uh, irregular migration to the United States. I, I'm, I, I know of no such request of uh President Petro, um, so we're going to have to take that question and try to get you an answer. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, not aware of, of Okay. Of he that. said uh, um, members of Biden administration requested to Colombia to build up a wall in uh, Tapón el Darien, which is border between Colombia and Panama, to reduce uh, illegal migration up to the United States. Just wanted to know. I, again, I, I know of no such request, um, but uh, we'll have to research that and, and get back to you. Um, what I would tell you, is that we continue to work with partners in the region, in the Western Hemisphere, to do what we all can do to stem the flow uh, of, of migration from south to north, driven by, of course, smugglers and human traffickers and you know, this, is this illegal pathway, which is why we are working with so many countries in the region to uh, develop uh, physical locations where migrants can go to pursue legal entries, at least into the United States, of course, and to reduce their risks of making that dangerous journey, um, you know, before they even, you know, b b before they even get started. 
So we're looking at all kinds of ways to address that the legal migration, and we are working with uh, many nations to do that. But I am not aware of any requests for some sort of wall or physical barrier. Um, and so I will we'll owe you a better answer on that. But uh, that has not been, aside from in, improving security at our border, and the president has asked Congress for more funds and more resources for the border uh, patrol, uh, aside from uh, you know, trying to, again, boost our resources at, at our border. Again, I know of no such requests uh, to do anything like that. Did that answer your question? Okay, you're smiling, so that's a good thing. <laughs> ma'am, in the back there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Yoshita Singh with Press Trust of India. You referred to President Biden's visit for the G20 uh, summit in Delhi very recently. Taking that forward, uh, this week at the UNGA, can we expect anything bilaterally between India and the US on uh, multi or during a forum such as Quad to take forward the vision of uh, the Indo-Pacific and Global South priorities? Thank you. I, I know of no bilateral discussions on, uh, on the President's agenda with the uh, with the Indian delegation here. I just had a chance to spend quite a bit of time uh, with Prime Minister Modi bilaterally in addition to the G20 agenda. So I'm not aware of any specific India-focused meetings on his uh, on his agenda while he's here in New York. But again, uh, we he came away from the G20 uh, feeling very positive and, and, and optimistic about the direction. I mean, there was an awful lot of great work done uh, at the G20, and we're all grateful to Prime Minister Modi for his presidency, for India's presidency of it, but also for the way the agenda was executed. It was a very, very productive couple of days. Let me go over here. Uh, oh, I already went to the back row. You, you right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank wait, wait for the microphone. Yes. You guys, you got to remember the rules. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Juan Silva from W Radio Colombia. Uh, just a short question. Colombia had a, an increase of illicit crops in coca recently. Uh, will there be more uh, resources for security from the United States to Colombia during uh, Petro's administration in spite of, for example, the growth of illicit crops or other problems of security? Are you asking me, are we, can you, will there be more resources applied by the United States yes, and, specifically and, on... Or which is the state of art of the relation between the United States and Colombia in terms of security, of support? Well, look, I mean, we uh, we commend President Petro's efforts to expand the scope of peace uh, in Colombia. Um, and uh, the Colombian government in general has taken many steps in recent years to do exactly that, to expand peace. Um, we certainly welcome the news of the six-month ceasefire that was uh, uh, agreed uh, last month. Uh, between the government uh, and the ELN. Um, we remain skeptical, uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, about uh, the ELN's intention to, uh, to adhere to the terms of, uh, of that ceasefire, but, uh, but we did welcome the news of it. I mean, the, all of that is of a piece of President Petro's desire to really, as I said, expand the scope of peace there. Um, I'll also tell you on 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 uh, drug trafficking. I mean, we're we're going to maintain a strong interest, of course, in preventing impunity for drug traffickers uh, in in general and for terrorists. Um, and of course, we're going to uh, continue to work with the government to to bring traffickers to justice. That's the best way I can answer that question. Um, yes, ma'am. You in the the red scarf there, black jacket. Thank you so much. I am Shin Young Park from Korea Economic Daily. Uh, at this time, what are the uh, conditions of Biden administrations uh, for lifting restric uh, restrictions for Chinese semiconductor? Lifting the restrictions? Restrictions for Chinese semiconductors. So let me just take... Um let me take that question a little bit higher. And one of the things that we certainly learned during the, uh, the pandemic was the fragile nature of our supply chain. And part of that we saw in the field of semiconductors, which is why uh, the president is working hard to shore up our supply chain. Um, uh, as he says, he, he wants the United States to be the beginning of it, not the end of it. Um, and it's also why we've taken action through an executive order not, re, uh, not long ago 
um, to uh, uh, restrict uh, investments, for, uh, U.S. investments in certain industries in, in China for our national security purposes, and some of that does include microelectronics and semiconductors. Um, but, and this is an important but, as my mom used to say, the most important part of any sentence is what comes after the word but. But it is limited to national security interests. It's not some complete ban. And um, uh, we're not interested in decoupling completely from the Chinese economy. Um, uh, we know there's a level of interdependence there. Um, so this isn't about decoupling. It is about taking the risk down. Um, and some of that risk is is in the semiconductor field because there's a, a national security component to it and the president wants to make sure we can maintain that. So it's a combination of supply chain resilience and national security needs, and that's what's driving our decisions. I don't I hope that answers your question. Yes, ma'am. I'm uh, Christiane Jacke from the German Press Agency, DPA. I have a few quick questions about the visit of uh, President Zelensky here. Um, first, will there be an informal visit of the president with Mr. Zelensky before they sit down in DC on Thursday, like here in New York? Also, will the president join Mr. Zelensky at the Security Council meeting on Wednesday? And do you have any more on the Washington leg of the trip? Will there be an address? Uh, to will he address Congress or will it just be a meeting with um, congressional leaders? And just an overall question to you. Um, How many questions is this? It's just very quick ones. This is like 17. <laughs> no, those were three very quick ones. Sounds and like the overall 17. ones is do you expect him to strike a slightly different tone that he's visiting now, maybe stressing more the gratitude part of? Um, President what, Zelensky? Yeah, the gratitude for, for the support given all the like the growing hesitancy and, and ongoing support in parts of the political spectrum. Okay, so uh, on 1A, uh, <laughs> I'm not aware, I, I'm not tracking any meeting between President Biden uh, and Mrs. Zelensky. I'm, uh, I'm not, I, I don't believe there is an engagement there uh, uh, between the two. The president is very much looking forward to hosting President Zelensky uh, back in Washington at a meeting at the, uh, at the White House. Uh, uh, they have met, I think this will be the third or fourth time uh, meeting at the White House uh, between the two of them. And of course, they speak uh, uh, on a fairly regular basis uh, over the phone. So it's uh, the meeting comes at, uh, as Jake said the other day, comes at a very critical time as uh, The Ukrainians continue to make progress in their counteroffensive uh, as Russia continues to reach out to rogue regimes like North Korea for support, um, and as the international community continues to gather as they are in Germany this week, uh, the, the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, uh, to discuss ways that uh, we can continue to support their forces in the field. So it comes at a critical time. The president's looking forward to hearing from President Zelensky about their counteroffensive and about the progress they're making, sort of his assessment of what the battlefield looks like. Um, but he also looks forward to making it very clear to President Zelensky that the United States, when we say we're with them for as long as it takes, we mean it. Uh, and, and he fully expects that that support will continue. Now, it is true that President Zelensky uh, will be visiting with members of Congress up on Capitol Hill, which, uh, again, we think is a very useful exercise. It's important for uh, Uh, members of Congress to hear directly from President Zelensky about all the same things that President Biden will hear from him. Um, I can't speak, nor would I, for President Zelensky and what he intends to say specifically or the tone in which he intends to deliver it. That's really for him. But I do want to address one thing that you you just kind of briefly mentioned, the, the, you know, the gratitude. President Zelensky has continually, continuously, publicly and privately expressed his gratitude for everything that this administration is doing to support Ukrainian forces in the field, as well as the support he knows has come from members of Congress and the American people who elected them in the first place. I would, I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb here to say that We can expect that President Zelensky will express that gratitude again, as he has consistently and as 
uh, we know he uh, really feels right down to his core. May I follow you, Ken? Sure, go ahead. Oh, thank you, John. Dmitry Anopchenko, Ukrainian television DC correspondent. Uh, it is one more reason to be grateful to America. It's uh, the new capabilities uh, United States provided to my country already and expected to provide. I know it's in, not in your power to announce something ahead of the president. So no, let that's yep. A good way so, for me to get fired. Yep. So let me keep it this way. May one expect that the new package for Ukraine will be announced or provided uh, during this day or? or during the meeting day in Washington? Again, I'm not going to get ahead of my boss. Uh, 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 but what I would tell you is that we have continually, on an almost regular basis, provided additional security assistance packages to Ukraine. I mean, in terms of drawdown authority, this is material that comes off the shelves from the Pentagon. Um, there, you know, we are announcing those, you know, almost every couple of weeks. So uh, I think you can, can, you should expect to continue to see additional security assistance packages for Ukraine. But what's in the next one and when's it going to get announced and who's going to announce it? I'm going to leave that uh, uh, for, uh, for others to speak to. But what President Zelensky, and, and I know I don't need to say this because he knows this, but as he comes here to New York and then to D.C., he should have and... We want him to have every expectation that additional security assistance will be provided by the United States. And just as importantly, and this gets lost a lot in the shovel, is from our allies and partners around the world, too. Some 50-some-odd other, other nations um, are contributing to Ukraine's ability to defend itself. Some of them are sending weapons, and tanks, and armored vehicles, and cruise missiles. Uh, others are providing financial assistance. but. Um, it's pretty clear to President Biden that the uh, international community really continues to, to coalesce in, uh, in, in trying to support Ukraine in the field, and President Zelensky um, should feel good about that support and that that support will continue. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Thanks so much, Mr. Kirby. My name is Alan Bulkati from RIA Novosti News Agency. Do you foresee any bilateral meetings with Russian delegation at the margins of the GA high-level week? And uh, when should one expect the um, response from the U.S. side to the expulsion of two uh, U.S. diplomats from Moscow? Will you inform Russia? Thank you. No bilateral discussions that I know of, and I have uh, I don't have anything to share on any possible response or reaction uh, uh, to uh, to the U.S. diplomats. That's really a better question put to our State Department. Uh, yes, sir. I'll come back to you, I promise. Go ahead. Thank you, Rafael Stanchik, Polish Television. I have a question on the grain ban, I mean the grains from Ukraine. Ukraine is going to sue Poland, Slovakia, and Hungary for not dropping the ban on the grains from Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, President Duda is going to discuss with President Zawenski in person here in uh, New York City about this issue. But is the White House aware of this growing tension between allies? Uh, is trying to help solve this problem? It could be a threat for the unity of the pro-Ukrainian coalition? So there's a lot there. I, I, um, yes, we are aware of concerns by uh, some of our European partners about uh, importing Ukrainian grain, point number one. Point number two, these are sovereign decisions. The whole fight in Ukraine, and you'll hear this from the president tomorrow, it's about the idea of sovereignty, which is embedded in the UN Charter. And wouldn't it be hypocritical of the United States uh, to be... Uh, uh, browbeating other nations about sovereign decisions that they're making uh, that they believe are in the best interest of, of, of their population. Um, so we're aware, um, I, I'm not uh, aware of, of any specific discussions that, uh, that are going on with respect to these decisions about grain imports. Um, we, I would just say that, one, we want to see the grain deal uh, put back in place and obviously continue to be extended. Russia is the holdup on that. Uh, and two, uh, we believe that that Ukrainian grain, because Ukraine is such a breadbasket for the world, uh, can do a lot to alleviate suffering, uh, economic inequality, uh, famine around the world. So we want to see that grain to market. Um, uh, but each nation has to decide uh, you know, for, for itself there. And you had another question 
I would just tell you that I would just tell you that we have and will continue to talk to our partners about their about their concerns with respect to in this case uh, uh, grain imports, but I don't have anything specific to read out or or, uh, or detail for you. Yeah, go ahead. Right there. Um, thank you, John. Uh, Oscar Gruzinski, Polish Press Agency. Uh, one question on the Malta meeting and the and Wang Yi going to Moscow immediately afterward. Um, ha, have you? Do you have any indication that uh, China is, uh, you know, preparing to change its approach to uh, supplying Russia? Um, and have you, uh, you know, communicated uh, anything to <coughs> about that? Um, and another question. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, President Biden will uh, call for um, the reform of Security Council, um, uh, but but you said uh, um, that he's going to call for including new members. But isn't the main source of dysfunction in the uh, Security Council the veto power of powers like Russia, which now are openly trampling uh, on the very foundation of, 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 the, of the charter? So would you support, um, you know, reforming the council in this way, like by, by strip, stripping or or maybe um, just limiting the veto powers of permanent members. Thank you. The president's main focus is on having a, a more inclusive and a larger uh, security council, both permanent and non-permanent. Um, as for what Russia has been doing, I mean, they they can make it uh, a lot easier on everybody if they just pull their troops out of Ukraine and stop violating the very UN charter that they've signed up to and actually met the obligations they signed up to for UN Security Council resolutions with respect to uh, uh, the transfer of arms, particularly uh, in, in and out of North Korea. All they got to do is behave the way they voted. Uh, and that's what we want to see Russia do, in addition to, of course, leaving Ukraine. Um, and I'm sorry, you had a, uh, the first question Malta, was Malta. Uh, uh, we have not seen uh, any indication that the PRC um, has changed their calculus or has decided to provide lethal capabilities to, to Russia uh, and to the R Russian armed forces. Um, and we continue to believe that it would not be in the PRC's best interest to do so. Um, so we're going to continue to watch this, but, but no indication that there's been any kind of a change in that regard. Guys, I can, I can take one more, and then I really do have to go. Iran? <laughs> well, what a choice! What a choice! I'll take I'll take both, but they got to be really quick. Go ahead. Just uh, thank you. Because that's a yeah. devil's uh, bargain there. This, uh, this is Alejandro Rincon with NTN24 International News Channel. So, uh, following uh, the release earlier today of American citizens that were uh, being held in Iran, is the U.S. government moving forward or making progress with other possible discussions that you may be having with uh, other regimes, maybe the Venezuelan regime with Nicolas Maduro? There's been chatters that there might be some lifting of sanctions just to secure the release of more Americans abroad. No, I do not have an update on uh, on any other negotiations involved with uh, seeing the release of wrongfully detained Americans around the world. Uh, today's a very good day, uh, and five American families will very shortly be reunited and whole again. Um, and I think we all need to take, take just a, a moment to pause and consider what that means for these five families who have suffered and waited and worried, uh, and not to mention their loved ones who didn't just wait, but actually physically and mentally suffered in, in abominable conditions uh, in Iran. So it's a good day in that regard. Uh, and we're glad to see that they're coming home, as you saw from President Biden's statement. Um, but all I can tell you is, uh, even though today's a good day for those families, uh, we know that there are still bad days happening for other American families, and we are continuing to work very, very hard to get all of our wrongfully detained Americans home where they belong, wherever they are. Um, and that, that work uh, is perpetual, and uh, I can assure those families who are waiting and worrying still uh, that we are still at that task, and we won't forget them, and we certainly won't forget their loved ones.
Israel. Uh, thank you, Admiral, um, for doing this. And Uriah Kraus from uh, Israeli Channel 13 News. Um, first of all, President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu are meeting this week. Why is it not happening at the White House? And does Biden plan on talking about the judicial overhaul? I'm not going to get... Go ahead. Did you have something else? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> are the discussions about the normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel progressing? Because we've he been hearing different reports. I just heard the uh, foreign firm... Affairs Minister Saudi of Saudi Arabia uh, saying that there is no solution to Israel to Israeli and Palestine situation without an independent Palestinian country. We are still committed to normalization. We believe uh, that uh, normalization and the integration of Israel into the region is good for everybody. It's good for the region. Certainly, it's good for uh, the Israeli people as well as uh, their neighbors. Um, and the president's going to continue to do whatever we can. Um, to see that outcome achieved. We understand, however, that the path mm -hmm. towards normalization, it's a sovereign path. It has to be decided by both Israel and Saudi Arabia, and we respect that. But, uh, but in their efforts to move towards normalization, they will find no better friend than the United States or President Joe Biden. Uh, look, I'm not going to get uh, too much ahead of the meeting on Wednesday between the prime minister and the president. Uh, we'll let those two leaders speak for themselves when they get a chance to sit down. President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu know each other well. Uh, they have had a long, long relationship with one another. Um, and um, no president is more pro-Israel than Joe Biden. Um, and uh, that, you know, all the way to his time back in the, in the Senate. Um, he has voted. He has acted. He has decided consistently uh, uh, for and in support. Uh, of Israel and uh, uh, the, the Israel's freedom, Israel's sovereignty, uh, and peace. Uh, he also continues to believe strongly that uh, that a two-state solution is not only viable but vital, um, and he will obviously always raise his interest in a two-state solution when he meets with leaders uh, uh, in in Israel and in the region. So that won't change from uh, from President Biden. Um, and look, as for the the venue, both men were coming to the General Assembly, so it made eminent sense that both men would take advantage of the opportunity to, to, to sit down and have another discussion. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks, everybody. I got to get going to my next thing. Appreciate it. Thank you.